And good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming online. And uh, this uh, Outside In series is an attempt to get the high school students and the younger adults to uh, get enthused in the area of ecology. So we've been having a series of uh, talks from fine speakers so far. And uh, today I'm happy to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Sumana Anagiri, uh, who is also the chairperson of the Biological Sciences in ISAR Calcutta. Uh, she has been conferred the Emerging Nations Award from Animal uh, Behavior Society in the year 2011. And Sumana uh, had uh, studied in um, Indian Institute of Science for her PhD. And at that time, she was working on social bars. And uh, subsequently, and now her research is all about ants, the nest architecture, the brood relocation, brood thefts, and so on. So yeah, but wait, are we not going to hear these stories from Sumana? Sumana, please. OK. <clears throat> uh uh, hi, uh, Professor Saudamini, um, and uh, good morning to all the listeners. Uh, hello, uh, Chindu, who is uh, moderating the session as well. Uh, welcome uh, to listening about ants this morning. Uh, I would uh, like to share my screen at this stage such that we can get started with the talk. Now, if my system works. Okay. Um, I hope you're able to see my screen and the title of uh, today's talk, Running yes. with Ants. Uh, are we yes, able to yes, see the screen? Yes, is that all right? Yes. Okay, and I hope uh, my voice is also audible. In case you know there is any such interruption, uh, then uh, we will uh, try to repair and get back uh, to the same. Uh, like I mentioned, not I'm sure every single person in the audience today has seen ants uh, in and around the area that you're living. Uh, even inside your uh, kitchens and uh, uh, living rooms, and not just seen them, but you've generally seen them running around. So in today's talk, I would like to introduce you to the life of these ants, what they do, where they live, and if they have to go from one house to another, how is this process brought about? Right. So that is the idea. Now, I would like to tell you the outline of uh, the talk that I will be able to uh, present today. And the outline is the following. We will be talking about uh, living in big families, uh, like the first box mentions, and uh, a lot of introduction to what is happening inside big families. And what is the theory that explains these complex societies? Then we'll be specifically moving on to ants and looking at the lives of ants, what is it that they have achieved Why in their presence on Earth? The particular model system that I'll be explaining in greater detail to all of you. And in the next stage, we will be conducting certain experiments, answering one specific question this morning. Uh, then we'll talk about the results of these experiments and discuss the journey that a scientists take in terms of the next step that they will be doing in these experimentation, right? Uh, so I hope you have an idea of what is going to be coming up uh, in this morning's session uh, of outside in. Before I start the content of my talk, I would like to introduce you to the place that I come from, which is Iser, Calcutta. Uh, this is the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Calcutta. It is located in West Bengal, like the star indicates in the map that is uh, attached in the slide. And a um, couple of days back, this is what our campus looks like from the window in my lab, right? The monsoons are going on, it's particularly green, and we had a lovely rainbow on that particular day. What we do in our institute is to pay equal emphasis to both teaching as well as research. And we have a large body of students, more than 2,000 of them. 
and it's a residential campus so most of these students are if not all are staying inside the campus we run three different programs bsms and this bsms program is where students join after 12th standard following different entrance exams of course and they will be here for five years on campus four years will be taken up with doing different uh, coursework and the fifth year will consist of a dissertation or a master's thesis so in this way we try to give a idea of both the formal coursework that is involved the sciences in all different sciences as well as give you a chance to do research uh, in the labs that are inside either kolkata and even outside <clears throat> the other highlight of our institute is that you have freedom to choose for your coursework from different aspects of science like biology physics chemistry math statistics as well as earth science so um, you can choose courses in all of these different subjects and then build the number of credits that is required in order to get your ms degree we also have integrated phd and phd programs uh, but for those people in the audience who are in school maybe the most relevant would be bsms <clears throat> and i request you to go look in the um, web page in order to get greater detail or write to any one of us uh, the faculty in order to get some detail so this is where we come from uh, all the work that i will be presenting will was conducted right here on our campus and uh, by students who are under these different programs so let's get back to looking at big families now given the current situation with covid as well as the shutdown of schools and so forth all of you i am sure are facing a great deal of woes problems right uh, that is related to the lockdown related to the lockdown of schools uh, our lifestyle has changed drastically right uh, and you are having being forced to spend all your time with your family now there are certain disadvantages to it i'm sure but there are a lot of advantages as well so i would like you to think about what these advantages are and how this would have been very different if you were really living in isolation absolute isolation all by yourself and what life would entitle if that was the case right so you certainly have lot of lockdown woes but there are several advantages as well for being within your family in times of crisis like this and even in general now while you are hunkered down in your families in your homes it is a good time to think about the other creatures that are living around you do some of them also live in big families uh, and is this a temporary state you know for only a period of time they're living and then after that they became they become completely isolated or do they always live in big families right uh this is something that uh, one needs to think about you know uh, consider whether this happens to the different creatures that are living right in your vicinity and later on you can expand that horizon into other areas of the world but just even starting from in your vicinity in your backyard inside your house there are several creatures how do they live right and one thing that humans are known for and we take great pride in is that we are always curious irrespective of our age irrespective of what our examinations require we are intrinsically curious creatures we would like to know what else is happening right and that is what i would like to appeal to you in the course of this talk and uh, towards the end as well right so humans have always had the sense of wonder we have looked at the natural habitat outside the organisms that live there plants animals microorganisms all of these creatures and always been fascinated with what their lives consists of right here i'm showing you one of the oldest documented records of animals various different mammals which was uh, done in the caves in spain 
And this is possibly one of the oldest cave paintings that we have in such great detail, which talks about the behavior of these animals. It's more than 20,000 years back where such paintings were done because the people there were really interwoven with the habitat that they live, the other organisms that live within that same habitat, right? So they would record the activities of these organisms in the form of these cave paintings. Now, this is just to say how, for how long we have been fascinated. In fact, our very life depends on how we deal with these other creatures, maybe not so much in the cities, but certainly if we were to live in wilder habitats, then our life will, and survival will depend on our understanding of other creatures that live there, right? So uh, for most of you, I'm sure at one point or the other, you would have looked at a little bird right in your backyard or when you're taking a walk, which has absolutely fascinated you, right? The activities that this bird is doing, the energy it has, the um, fluttering that uh, this bird is showing in terms of its wings while it goes from one place to another, looks for its food and so forth. So I'm sure that you would have a moment where you say, wow, just look at this little bird or something similar, a butterfly, you know, maybe a crow, uh, which is just sitting in your balcony. So the point is that we are curious by nature and we would like to understand the world around us and the creatures that are present in this world, right? So uh, the sense of wonder is something that is amazing. And enhancing this is the idea that there is enormous diversity in this world. Right? Humans are just one species in a whole galaxy of living organisms, right? So we have been able to give names and describe about 1.7 million species on Earth, whereas there are another 6 million that are estimated to be around and which are waiting even for a simple name to be attached to these organisms. Their lives go on just fine. It's just that humans are curious and we would like to know what is there uh, before most of them vanish. So those creatures which have a backbone really form a very small part of this gamut of organisms. The vertebrates, those are creatures with a backbone. And if you see here, amphibians, for example, frogs, birds, fish, mammals, reptiles, form a very small part of this 1.7 million species that are present with us. And remember, humans are just a single one of these vertebrates. And we like to spend a great deal of time and effort in understanding the biology that goes on within us, but there is a great deal of richness in terms of what other creatures are present, what their lives are. If there are such a large number of creatures, then the question is, what is motivating them as well? Why do animals and birds and even plants behave in a particular manner, right? Why do they do whatever it, it is that they are doing? That is a very fundamental question, right? What is the motivation for the behaviors and the acts that they are performing? For a long time, uh, we did not understand it enough. We do not have any support or ideas of what they were doing, apart from bringing in religion. Uh, now, if we were to look at the science behind it and what our understanding is, then we have to come to the theory of natural selection, right? So all of the creatures that I was uh, giving you a glimpse about, uh, millions of them, really have the same challenges. They need to survive, they need to reproduce, they need to find the next uh, meal, uh, they need a place to rest, they have to fight with different diseases and overcome these diseases, right? So these are very similar to the things that humans do. Now the question is, can there be an understanding of the underlying phenomena that explains the activities of all of these organisms, what is happening and why something is happening. 
Okay? The closest we have come to that is in this theory of natural selection. This was proposed in 1859, and it was done by two people, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russ Wallace. Uh, I've put the pictures of both of these uh, gentlemen here on the slide. Mm, Darwin, uh, when he was about 18 years old, uh, if you can see my pointer, uh, went on a long journey. And uh, after the exposure to many different things on his journey, he came up with this theory. Now, for some of you who are curious about the kinds of human beings that both of these people were, uh, Darwin's father and grandfather were both doctors, and they really wanted Charles Darwin also to become a doctor. But Darwin, Charles Darwin was not really very good at his studies as documented by his teachers. Excuse me, wait a second. <clears throat> so uh, Darwin had to be taken out. Charles had to be taken out from a couple of schools and he was uh, not doing too well. So his uh, suggestion, he told his family that I would like to go on a voyage. The family said no, but then the deal was that he will be allowed to go on his voyage but when he comes back, he has to study and become a clergyman uh, so that his family would be satisfied. And before he left on his voyage, when he was about 18 years or so, they made this portrait that you're seeing on your screen because at that time, going in a ship for more than six months outside, there is no guarantees that you will come back to your family. So they wanted to remember him by this portrait. And the other gentleman here you're seeing is Alfred Russell Wallace. He was a Scottish uh, gentleman and he was a lawyer by profession, but he also traveled in order to collect different spe specimens and species from exotic parts of the world. And in the process, they came upon this theory. The theory of natural selection is really what is tying together a great deal of what we think, why organisms are doing what they're doing. And what this theory says, in very simple terms is the following, that there is a great deal of variation among individuals that constitute a group or a population of organisms. And these individuals will compete among each other in the background of a changing environment, right? The environment is changing all the time. Whether it is temperature, rainfall, humidity, disease, predators, the environment is changing all the time. So, in this changing environment, all of these different variations, different forms, phenotypes of these organisms will compete with each other and compete to do what? To survive and to reproduce, right? To have a larger number of offspring. So those variations which are good at surviving and reproducing will pass on to the next generation. And they are the ones who will populate that area as time goes on. So the entire struggle of all these creatures is basically in order to just live, to survive in a changing environment and to reproduce and have a large number of copies, right? So this was published in the book that I have put up here. It's called The Origin of Species by Darwin. Now, this is the central framework in which we try to understand what is happening. This framework applies to all living creatures. If they are solitary creatures, for example, like mosquitoes, crickets, cockroaches, dragonflies, butterflies, as in that they live by themselves, they have to fend for all their needs by themselves, whether it is to find food, whether it is to lay eggs, or whether it is uh, to survive from uh, approaching predators, all of this is done in a solitary manner, right? In contrast to this, there are certain other organisms which live in aggregates, loosely organized groups where there can be a herd of uh, zebra or a pride of lions or a family of meerkats as mentioned or as shown in here in these images. So these aggregates or loosely organized groups also have to do the exact same thing, survive and to reproduce. However, they are not entirely alone in this business. 
they will take help from other members of this group, right? So uh, both of these kinds of creatures, and of course, even plants, have the same policy to survive and to reproduce. We looked at loose aggregates like a whole horde of locusts or a herd of zebra, but there are certain societies which are even more complicated. They really form very large families, big families. For example, I'm sure you have seen such uh, hives of honeybees. This is called Apis dorsata. It is the rock bee that we find in India. And many buildings, for example, this inside our research complex, constitutes one colony, this entire structure. It will have approximately 40,000 bees, all of them females, with only one queen in the colony who is reproducing. All the members of this society uh, are her daughters. Further, uh, there is a very clear understanding of what is the jobs that these different workers do. Some of the workers, depending on their age, will do one particular task, like nurse the larva, while others will go out and bring food, like nectar and pollen and water, and will help the colony. There are others who specialize in removing dead bees, and others who are nurses and take care of the brood. So if we were to do a close-up of the hive, you will see such hexagonal cells built of wax. And these are worker bees who inspect each of these cells, take care of the egg ones that are growing inside here, which are collectively called as brood, and bring them up to adulthood. And when they emerge from such a, pupil, such a case, such a cell, then those animals will help the family further in producing more and more progeny. Right? So this is an example of a very, very well-organized, complex society, and we will be going into this in a little more detail. Now, if we recall, the upper part of this graph is the theory of natural selection. The aim really for all organisms on Earth is then to reproduce, to survive, have higher number of offspring. Right? So if there is any behavior that benefits the organism in terms of uh, by doing a particular behavior, uh, the benefit is number of offspring that they can produce and the cost by performing that behavior. If that is lower than the benefit of performing a behavior, so if B is greater than C, then that particular behavior will be selected for by natural selection. And this behavior will be seen in the entire population of this organism as time passes by, right? So this can apply for any behavior that these organisms will perform. As long as B, the benefit is greater than the cost of doing that behavior, then there will be a selection advantage, right? And these organisms will be able to produce higher number of offspring. Now, while this theory of natural selection is the central theme of what has happened in this uh, community to understand the evolution of organisms, the ultimate question of why organisms are doing certain jobs, this theory fails to explain certain basic phenomena as well, right? So most of our textbooks, uh, at least at the level of the school, is filled with a large number of things which is explaining everything that we see, but it is not uh, telling us really the things that we do not understand, even though there's a large number of things in the world that humans fail to understand. The theory of natural selection does not explain certain phenomena, and that phenomena is what I've listed here in this slide. So for example, the theory of sele natural selection does not explain the origin of life. It does not explain why there are differences between males and females for particular species, right? So certain organisms, the male and female both look identical and they behave also fairly identically. So if you were to take the example of a crow, uh, it, you will be hard pressed to say whether a given crow is a male or a female unless you do an examination of the same. Uh, 
However, there are certain other organisms where it is very clear cut as to which is a male of the pup or a male uh, and which is the female. So the first thing that will spring to your mind when I say this is the peacock, right? There is absolutely no, no confusion in an adult peacock as to who is a male and who is a female. Now, Darwin and Wallace in their theory of natural selection could not explain these differences between males and females. Further, they could also not explain why some organisms never reproduce. The central theme of the theory was that everything that organisms do is really to enhance the number of offspring that they produce. If that is the case, then you cannot expect some animals on earth to be performing behaviors that ensure that they will not have offspring, right? So this is a direct contradiction to what the theory of natural selection explains. Further, they also do not explain why certain organisms sacrifice their lives. The very first component that I wanted to touch upon is the differences between males and females. This giant Irish elk that you can see, the male is in the foreground and he has huge antlers, right? Antlers which weighed about a hundred pounds were very, very large. And the male carries this, whereas the female does not. So the question is, if they're living in the same environment, then why is it that only the male has such antlers, right? So this is a question that is very fundamental but natural selection did not have an answer for this. We just spoke about the peacock and the glorious tail that male peacocks carry on them, right? Now, only males have this. If this train of the peacock helps in the survival of the males, then it should be a feature that's present on females as well. Why is it that only the the males carry such elaborate traits, right? Now, to think about this a little further, I wanted to show you this image. So if we were to get dressed up in a similar train, like the male peacock, just think of the disadvantages that you will have. Please remember that this picture is about a fashion show. However, the male peacocks lives in its natural habitat in the scrub and jungle of our countries, right? So it has predators, it has parasites, and it has a large amount of wind and dust and huge number of other parameters in order to live with. So if you had to carry such a train and go about your daily activities, just think of the disadvantages that you have. Then the question is why do males have such trains at all? Right? So these are things that I want you to consider as we progress along the talk, but today's talk will not deal with answers to this particular two questions that I raised. Um, that would be a topic for some time else. And in fact, Darwin himself proposed the answer to this in a subsequent book that he wrote. But today what I will be talking to you about is a little uh, the other two phenomena that I was mentioning in the list of things that natural selection cannot explain. And the first of that is suicide. Uh, I hope that uh, you have not had the misfortune of being stung by a honeybee. Uh, but if you've played around outdoors enough, and if there are sufficient number of honeybee colonies in the area that you live, you or one of your friends would possibly be stung by honeybees. As you can see, there's an adult honeybee here. And the sting that she had has been lodged into the skin of this unfortunate human being. What happens is there are barbs on the sting when you take a greater uh, close-up picture and these barbs lodge into the uh, skin of the organism that the honeybee has uh, uh, stung. And what happens is because of this, the abdomen of the honeybee gets ruptured and this is part of the intestine of the honeybee that gets left behind together with the poison sac while the honeybee flies away, right? 
So the honeybee is gravely injured after stinging uh, the organism that was disturbing them. And subsequently, this honeybee will die, right? So natural selection cannot explain this kinds of suicide, right? Suicide because the adult is going to die for the act of stinging. This act of stinging is going to make uh, the organism which received the sting remember bees for a long time, receive a degree of poison into their bodies such that it becomes very painful uh, and you will think twice before approaching another honeybee colony, right? But natural selection cannot explain these acts of suicide. Another thing that natural selection cannot explain is why there are thousands of creatures like the ants that I'm showing you here, particularly the ones in the lower panel, these are workers and soldiers. Thousands of these populate a colony, but they never ever reproduce, right? Only the queen of the colony, which is shown in the front, in the top panel, the female who mates with this male will lay eggs and reproduce. She will have her progeny. But these workers will not mate and they will never reproduce. Further, these workers are not identical to each other. They can be physically very different from each other. For example, some workers are about 200 times smaller than other workers within the same colony, right? So there is massive differences in the morphology of workers and these workers never reproduce. This is a puzzle that natural selection cannot explain, right? And this puzzle was recognized by Darwin himself. He made a note of this in the book that I was showing you earlier. And he said that there is one aspect which is actually fatal to my whole theory. I allude to the neuters or the sterile females in insect communities. These neuters often differ widely in instinct and in the structure, both from the males and fertile females. And yet, from being sterile, they cannot propagate their kind. So remember natural selection theory says that producing offspring is the main and most important aspect of all living organisms. However, there are thousands of ants roaming around right in our vicinity, which will never actually reproduce. So how do you put these things two together, right? So uh, that was a puzzle. Darwin in his lifetime did not have an answer to this puzzle. However, much later in 1964, there is an answer to this puzzle. And the answer originates in what is called as Hamilton's rule. Right? Hamilton proposed a formulation where he said such acts, he called them altruistic acts, where organisms are not producing their own offspring, but they help others produce offspring. Right? This is called as an altruistic act. Um, when you can consider the benefit and the relatedness together to the other individuals to whom you're supporting and helping, and if that is higher uh, than the cost, the benefit is being higher than the cost, then such altruistic acts where organisms give up their own reproduction in order to help other creatures will be also selected. This will be favored in the population. Many organisms will show such behaviors. So RB minus C should be greater than zero, right? And I have explained that R is the coefficient of relatedness between the two organisms which are engaging in this behavior. Benefit is B and cost is C uh, for doing this particular um, act or behavior, right? Now, this came to be known as skin selection. If one animal is helping the kin or a related animal, in producing higher number of organisms, higher number of offspring, then this behavior will be selected for. So kin selection and Hamilton's rule 
explained one aspect of the behaviors that we see around us, um, which natural selection theory was not able to do. To simplify this further, for any given act or behavior, altruistic genes would spread in the population, means organisms will help others at the cost of uh, their own offspring when the cost is lower than the benefit multiplied into relatedness. However, selfish genes, genes which promote the production of your own offspring as compared to production of other offspring will spread in the population if the benefit is higher than the cost related into. It's the essence of kin selection. I have simplified these concepts a great deal, uh, but I hope I'm able to explain to you that this second idea of kin selection explains a great deal of the complexity that we see inside animal societies, particularly complex societies, right? Now, we dwell a greater deal into well-organized societies, wasps, termites, and ants form in well-organized societies. There are certain reasons why we call them as eusocial societies. You don't need to worry so much about it, but these are not loose aggregates, but they are very, very well organized. There are more than 20,000 species of insects which fall into this group. And these organisms have been on there on Earth for more than 150 million years. And they're very, very successful in the habitats that they occupy. So ants have been here on Earth. They're part of this eusocial uh, system of societies. And they've survived on Earth for a long period of time. The dinosaurs were present on Earth at the time that ants were there. Then the dinosaurs disappeared. However, ants continue to be on Earth, right? So that means they're really successful in surviving across changing environments. Ants are present in all parts of the world and they contribute about one third the weight of all living creatures the terrace, on the terrestrial habitats, right? So this suggests that they're very, very successful. There's a large number of these organisms, right? Uh, so they're doing very well in the world around us, right? There are around 12,000 species of ants that have been recorded so far. Ants, they have achieved a great deal of things. In order to highlight what they're doing, uh, they are herders. So they keep cattle in the form of these small aphids that you see in this image. Uh, these aphids will produce drops of sugary liquid after drinking sap from this plant over here. And ants will herd these aphids, take these small sugar secretions that these aphids do, uh, and eat that for their own nutrition. Uh, and this is very similar to the way we keep cattle in our uh, societies. Ants are known to have uh, produced or harbor bacteria in their back, particular patch here on their thorax, which produces chemicals, uh, which can act as antibiotics in their fungal gardens, right? So for most of you who have uh, done any level of gardening, you know that all the time there are weeds in your garden, unwanted plants, and you need to get rid of those weeds. And one manner by which ants get rid of unwanted fungus and bacteria within their fungus garden is using these antibiotics. And this is seen in leaf cutter ants, which are portrayed in the bottom. And this is the garden of fungus that they produce. <coughs> Uh, excuse me. Further, ants live in extremely well-organized cities. Uh, the picture that I'm showing you here is of a single colony of ants, uh, just one colony. And for scale, there are these human beings who are excavating the nest of one single ant colony. This colony was in Argentina. 
This is the colony made by the ants, the fungal growing ants, leaf cutter ants, which I'm showing you on the left panel. They have multiple chambers and tunnels which are connecting from one to another. So they live in mega cities. Uh, they are known to be uh, tremendous earth movers. So they are recycling uh, a lot of uh, material. They move as much earth as earthworms uh, in our agricultural fields, in our gardens. They are excellent pest control agents. They also provide protection from herbivory um, by patrolling the plants of interest for them. Uh, they're excellent or the number one scavengers of invertebrates on the planet. Uh, the moment there is a dead insect or any food lying around, ants will attack this and consume it as food and take it back to their nests, right? So these are some of the interesting things that ants do. Now, uh, I would like to progress and move on to ask, uh, what are the kinds of experiments that we can do with these ants? Right? Uh, ants that are found here right in the vicinity. As scientists, we would like to ask a question, think of a potential answer, and we test these potential answers or hypothesis, find this answer, and add that to the bank of knowledge that already exists. So the primary job of us as scientists are to ask questions and to do experiments in order to answer these questions. So this is Diacama indicum, uh, the ant that you see here. It's a one centimeter long ant. It is present in India, Sri Lanka, and maybe in Japan. And this ant is the focal system or the ant for which we will be conducting a certain ex few experiments in the course of uh, the remaining time in this talk. Right? So this ant is called Diacama indicum. Now, uh, in order to be working with these ants, we would have to go and collect them from the natural habitat. And in this video, I would like to show you how we maintain these ants in the lab. This is a nest or a colony of ants. And there are several foragers who collect the ant cake that we have provided them and take it back into the nest. So these foragers will collect food and take them back to the nest. And as we are stepping out from the lab through our window to literally our backyard, we have to locate these colonies in the natural habitat. And in order to do that, we will follow foragers. Right? Foragers like you saw in the lab environment will collect a piece of food and go back to their nest. So we come to the natural habitat and there are numerous ants going around, but we want to find Diacama indicum colonies in this habitat, right? So you will see that Manish, uh, who is a PhD student, and Ghosh Babu, who helps in our lab, went to this uh, habitat right behind our building, and they found this ant, which is holding a termite in its mouth, in its mandibles, and is coming back to its nest. So we follow returning foragers and then spot the nest. She is still getting back and here is the nest. So the forager will enter into this nest and now we know the location of that nest. From this, we collect colonies by flooding these colonies with water in a systematic manner and bring these colonies back to lab. Once we do bring it back to the lab, it is not sufficient to say that there is one ant which is black in color. We would like to know what different ants are doing in terms of the work that they perform. So what we are going to do is mark all these ants with unique colors. For example, this is a white dash dash ant, whereas this is white, 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 and so forth. So we give individual identity to ants such that we can recognize on average, the 100 different small ants that are present in the colony, what is the jobs that these 100 different ants are doing, right? So uh, we first of all identify them individually and then start thinking of the experiments that we can perform. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that we'll give you a glimpse of what their home looks like. And 
In order to do that, we locate the entrance of the nest in the manner that I explained to you. And then by doing this for 70 different colonies across different seasons, what we find is such an entrance. And if I were to uh, melt some aluminum and pour aluminum through this nest entrance, then I can get a cast of the nest, as you can see over here in this diagram. And by studying this cast, I will be able to tell you about the architecture of their homes, right? So is this a one bedroom apartment or is this uh, a multi-story building? What is this, right? What is there inside this entrance? And the answer is in Dakama Indicum, they have really one single chamber and an entrance tunnel and a runoff tunnel as indicated in this particular picture. So they live really in very simple nests. Um, there are around 100 individuals on average in these nests. All of them are females, but only one of them will reproduce and lay eggs while the remaining are workers. So this is the simple nest that they have. Okay, the nest is good. However, sometimes they have to relocate from one nest to another. I'm sure you have also participated in relocating your houses. You would have to find a new house once you decide that you have to move from the current one. You would have to pack up all your material, transport them, and transport them along the shortest route, right? So you would have to figure out what would be the shortest route, let us say, from Calcutta, where I am, if you have to reach Bangalore, right? So you would have to have an idea of what is the shortest route, what is the map, how do you navigate from area A to area, to point A, point a to point B, right? And once you have reached the new house, you have to settle down in that house as well as in the different area. In today's talk, I want to focus only on this aspect, which is transportation, right? And about if ants can find the shortest route between point A and point B, right? Now, if we did not have Google Maps, then finding or navigating from point A to B, whether it is two cities or whether it is a small, uh, it is from one street to another within your own locality is not intuitively obvious. And please think of it as to what it would mean to an ant, which is a centimeter long and in a very complex habitat that they live in, right? So the question is, can ants find the shortest route? This is the principal question that we will be investigating today. The answer to this in literature is yes. Ants that lay chemical trails, trails on the substrate, okay? Those ants are known to be able to find the shortest route. And it is not because of the cognition of the ants, but it is because of the properties of the chemicals that they're laying down, right? So this is known in literature. However, for ants that do not use chemical trails, the question is, can they find the shortest route? Now, why am I interested in ants that cannot lay chemical trails? Because diacoma indicum. OI dash is leading O O O. It's an LFL. Diacoma indicum does not lay chemical trails, but instead performs tandem running with a leader and a follower. In this video, like you saw, the leader brings a follower one at a time from the old nest into a new nest here within our laboratory with constant physical contact between the leader and the follower. This behavior is called as tandem running. The leader knows of the new nest and will bring each member of her nest from the old to the new. In this manner, using tandem runs, they do not produce chemical trails. Right? So the question is, can these ants, without the aid of chemical trail, find the shortest route? Right? I hope I have made the question clear. Now, in order to answer this question, OI dash is leading O O O. It's an LFL. We know the individual identities of ants, and we would like to know whether all these leaders are capable of optimizing their route. Right? I'm just showing you the tandem run once again. Now, in order to answer these questions, 
uh, whether they can find the shortest route. We have to think about this phenomena, right? And in this whole process, uh, Snigdha Mukhopadhyay, uh, the person whose image I put here in the bottom, uh, is my PhD student, and she has performed these experiments, and we have tried to understand this phenomena together, right? So we asked, can ants, first of all, use multiple routes? If you need to find the shortest route, then you should also be capable of knowing that there are multiple routes, right? If you find one route and just stick to that same route every time you go from A to B, then there is very less chance that you will be able to find different routes or the shorter route among the different routes that you have. So we asked if the old nest is connected, old nest here is connected to the new nest using two bridges, these are two different routes, will ants take both these bridges or just one? If they were to take just one, then there is no question of asking, will they take the shortest route? Any route that they encounter, only one route is what they take. So don't worry about asking whether there's a shortest route. However, if they take both the routes, then that means they're capable of understanding that there can be multiple routes and hence they can choose one of them or they'll have the potential to choose between them. So to do that, you can't just put one single ant in the setup and see which route she takes and come to a conclusion. Instead, what you have to do is collect nine different colonies, mark all the individuals, about 100 of them in each of these colonies, and make them relocate from the old nest to the new nest while you take down very detailed information of who is walking on route A and who is walking on route B, right? And it takes a great deal of time, effort, and patience in order to be able to do this. And when we did perform, we found that Dacoma indicum took both the routes that were available to them. And we found that in fact, they use these multiple routes equally in the experiments that we conducted. So the question is, can tandem running ants use multiple routes? And the answer is yes. Having answered this, we ask the next question. In this case, both the routes are of equal distance. But if I were to give one long and one short route, will Dakama Indicum take the shorter route? And of course, that is our next experiment. If tandem running ants are given a shorter path as an option, will they take it, right? So in this new setup, the old nest is connected to the new nest by one short path and one long path. The long path is double the length as compared to the short path, right? Now, what we do, we collect nine fresh colonies and ask whether these colonies are capable of choosing the shorter path for tandem running as compared to the longer path. And remember, both these paths have to be first discovered by ants in these colonies. The answer to this, after conducting this experiment 10 times, is in this graph that I'm showing you over here. So the, remember the whole colony, all the 100 members have to be taken by tandem running. And we can catalog how many tandem runs went through the shorter path and how many went through the long path. And if you look at this graph, this black line is what you have to worry about for present. This is called the median of the distribution. And you can see more than 80% of the tandem runs in a given colony were conducted on the short path, right? This path. And only about 15% was conducted on this long path. And one has to do statistical analysis with the distribution of this data to say that whether to confirm that this is significantly different from each other. And the answer is that they are significantly different. This cannot happen by chance alone. And if ants are given one shorter path and a longer path, they choose to take the shorter path most of the time. Right? So these ants are capable of choosing the shorter path. However, please think on this a little greater detail and realize that just some colonies could have an inclination to go take a right-hand turn, right? Take a right turn, then you will end up here from the old nest. 
If you were to go straight, then you would possibly go on the longer part. So maybe they have a tendency to take the right turn a greater deal than to go straight. If such biases occurred, then we can get this result, not because ants can optimize, but just because of the manner in which this experiment was conducted. So in order to make life a little more complicated for the ants, what we did is we tested their ability to choose the shorter path in a different setup. This setup is a bit more complicated and there are bigger loops and smaller loops and multiple places where ants have to decide whether they will take a right turn or they'll take a left turn. Remember, this is the old nest, this is the new nest. Ants have to travel from here to here using tandem running. Now, if ants had a tendency to take right turn at all time, or if they were to take the left turn at all time, then you can expect what is the route that they will take, right? So one short and one long loop of the path or the bridge that we have given them. However, when we conducted another set of experiments uh, with 10 colonies each, then we find that even in this complicated setup where there are multiple options, tandem leaders, the tandem leaders significantly choose the shortest option, which consists of this path where you go here and then you go on this part, right? And it is not either left or right, but a combination of left and right that this all ants would have to choose. So organisms, the ants, the tandem leaders took SS path or the short, short turn at both decision point one and two in order to reach their nest. So the, uh, as you can see in the graph over here. So can tandem running ants choose the shortest path when there are multiple options? The answer is yes. These ants can choose the shortest path even when they have multiple options. Now, this brings us to the end of the three experiments that I wanted to explain to you in today's talk. Uh, but in summary, what did we discover, right? Our question was, can ants which do not use chemical trails find the shortest route? And we have discovered that yes, ants can find the shortest route, correct? They are capable of finding the shortest route and using this in the context of colony relocation. Then, the next obvious question that should come to your mind is, how will they do it? If there is no chemical trail to guide them, then how can they figure it out? The whole ant is one centimeter. So think about what the size of their the cognitive system can be, the neural system can be, and how are they capable of figuring out which is the shortest route? Inputs from either vision, olfaction, magnetic fields, polarized light, are they playing a role? Or are internal mechanisms like path integration playing a role? And how do we find answers for this? Of course we do more experiments, right? That is the job of us scientists. Now, what kind of experiments can we do? The kind of experiment that we have started is to block the vision of ants and ask, are they still capable of finding the shortest route? Then you can ask me, how do you block the vision of ants? It's quite simple. And I want to give you this image to help you understand how we make ants blind. We, of course, mark ants for individual identity. So this ant is white, tan, tan. But in addition, on her eyes, which are these two areas here on its head, we put yellow color paint to completely block any light from entering their eyes. Both the eyes are totally blocked. And we do this for all the members in the colony and then ask, are visual inputs essential for ants to figure out what is the shortest path, right? These are ongoing experiments and in today's talk, I'm not going to be telling you what the results of these experiments are, uh, but it has been really fun to do them. Now, 
In today's talk, I gave you a glimpse of whether ants can find the shortest route, right? However, we work on a whole series of things involving the brood of the uh, ants, the young and developing stages, how ants find a new nest, how do they bring their belongings from one place to another, how do they settle down, how do they transport material from one place to another, right? And given the timeline of this talk, I will not be going into details of all this, but if you are curious, then I have given the lab web page in the bottom of the screen, and I welcome you to visit this web page to understand in greater detail what is happening in our lab, right? So, in the end, what I would request is, please continue to be curious, right? Look for living creatures and phenomena that is of interest, that you're curious about in your backyard and beyond. There are wonderful creatures, uh, fascinating creatures right in our vicinity. And we only have to keep our minds open to explore the lives of these individual organisms, right? And always ask questions. Ask questions how something is happening, where is it happening, and most importantly, why something is happening, right? So this is something that you have to keep within yourself, keep asking questions. You may not find the answers in the short run, but it is a process. And be fascinated with what is there in your vicinity. Right? There is a world outside your textbooks, and this world is absolutely fascinating. Uh, you need to explore this and have an interest in understanding this. And that makes life far more interesting than in general, right? It's not just what is there in your textbooks, but a whole lot waiting to be explored, starting from our own backyards. Today in this talk, I told you about tandem running ants, and I hope that we have had a nice jog in the world of ants, and I hope that you enjoyed the process of it. So I would like to stop by saying that I have made a lot of concepts in this presentation relatively simple, so that you know eight standard students and others can understand this, but please look at the references if you're interested in any greater detail, I have acknowledged this. My students who have taken wonderful videos and do a great job in exploring these fascinating ideas, the ants, and the funding that I receive. I would also like to thank uh, Bangalore Life Science Cluster, Chendu, who is organizing this, uh, uh, mediating this talk, and uh, Professor Saudamini, who invited me to give this talk and share the research that we're doing in our lab. So thanks a great deal. I would be happy to answer your questions. And also, if you don't feel comfortable asking at this point in time, you're more than welcome to contact me at the email address that I've given you here, uh, which is anagiri.sumana at gmail.com. So thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Sumana. That was really interesting. And uh, we have uh, several questions uh, in, uh, in our Q&A box and on YouTube as well. Okay. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to tell everyone, if anyone wants to uh, speak out their question, please raise your hand and we will get to you in a little while. And for those of you watching on YouTube, please type your questions out and we will, uh, we will address them as well. So I'm going to begin with a question on YouTube because uh, I find that I found that one very interesting. And the question is, how do we establish an ant culture in lab so that school children can initiate research activities that are, uh, you know, that they will, uh, that they are interested in. So I think this is a really great uh, thing that you could talk about. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Chendu. And uh, so, uh, as you, I'm sure you've seen, there's several species of ants which occupy our homes. I mean, you don't even have to go to your backyard. So uh, what you should do is give a piece of food exactly like how we do and follow where the ants are taking this food to, right? So then you will know where the address of the nest is. Once you've established where they're living, then you have to very carefully collect them and 
one of the methods that work best is by water flooding. So once you know their nest, put small quantities of water over uh, a long period of time such that their chambers get flooded. Once the chambers get flooded, the ants will start emerging from this small entrance hole and you can collect them using a plastic tube which is fitted into that entrance such that the ants will walk into the plastic tube and get collected into a container. Now, if you collect a large number of workers, that is not good enough. You need the queen of the colony in order to be able to keep it sustained for a long period of time. Now, once you have the queen, which will be morphologically different, she will be larger in size as compared to workers, then you can keep this entire setup within a plastic box and make sure that you coat the plastic box with Vaseline such that the ants cannot escape your setup. And then depending on what species of ant it is, you have to provide them dead insects as food or honey water as food or a combination of both in order to be able to keep them in your, in your school setups or the laboratory setup and to understand their behavior. Okay, thank you so much, Sumana. There's another question, anonymous one, and uh, they're asking, are there any uh, ethical or permissions, ethical issues or permissions that need to be taken care of, uh, you know, while conducting this whole process of, you know, taking an ant colony and putting it into a lab? Yes, uh, let me explain. Uh, in the current uh, scenario, uh, insects, particularly ants, do not fall under the purview of uh, major constraints in terms of uh, what experiments we can do and we cannot do. Now, as a society, this is not a good thing. I mean, all living creatures are equal in many ways and one needs to have such guidelines. But at the present time, such guidelines do not exist for ants. So if an ant colony is in your house, you want to collect it, it is absolutely not a problem. It does not fall into any ethical uh, purview, somebody cannot object for you to do this. However, you have to be humane with them. I mean, you're, you're trying to be what best you can while dealing with it. However, if the species of ant is within a reserve forest or uh, area that is declared as a protected area, ants from that area cannot be collected. But if there is a colony in your house, I mean, let us, uh, acknowledge that there are several individuals who will go to their garden and kill ants just like that. I mean, without any reason or right. So uh, collecting them and keeping them in your, uh, for the sake of doing science should be just perfectly all right. There is no such norms which protect this uh, uh, in order to be able to perform experiments with them. Thank you, Sumana. I thought that answered the question really well. Uh, another question from uh, Shweta Hegde is that she says, many a times I have wondered that ants do some moves with their legs while they pass each other. Is that a type of communication between them? If yes, yes what are they communicating? Okay, yes, uh, certainly. So if you have a chemical trail, so you drop a piece of sugar in your uh, kitchen floor, it takes in my house about seven minutes before the ants will make a trail in order to collect that bit of sugar. Uh, on a random day, I mean, it, this is just the background. So uh, along this trail, if you look it's with any deal of attention, you will find that ants are walking to and fro from this place. And those that come opposite each other will typically antenate each other, uh, you know, just say, touch like this before they go in two different directions. I think this is what uh, Shweta is alluding to. And what ha is happening is that the ants world is mostly dealing with chemicals and they use their antenna to sense these chemicals. So one ant is really touching the other ant's antenna and body in order to confirm that the second ant is a nest mate. It belongs to the same colony. Primarily that is what is happening. And then if they confirm that it is of the same colony, then they will proceed into whatever else they were doing. But if they touch each other and feel or sense that it is not their colony, but a different colony's ant, then this touch will become larger in the terms that it will go antenate for a longer period of time and there will be aggression towards non-colony mates. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, so it's kind of a 
chemical i card uh, that yes. uh, absolutely absolutely so they are just touching each other to confirm that they belong to the same colony now if the answer is yes if the id agrees with whatever they think is their colony then they proceed in their job otherwise it will be it will gallop into a fight awesome very interesting you know this is one more way of iding people maybe in the future so <laughs> yes, <laughs> how you smell <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> so uh, that's another uh, question. I think Jaydeep has raised his hand, so we will allow him to talk. We're running okay. a little bit short on time, so sure. yeah. Um, Hello. Yeah. Hey, Jaydeep. Please tell Hi. me. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for such a wonderful uh, lecture and the information that you have given. Uh, so my question was: Has the role of a reward in finding the shortest route has been studied in your lab? Okay. What For do you example, mean by reward? Yeah. So there are two routes. In the oh. first case that you said, there are two routes with the same length going to the Correct. new nest from the old nest. Yes. So suppose there is a um, sugar uh, or like there is a food in yes. one of the routes. Will the ants prefer that route to okay. go to the new colony? Okay. Or will they? Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me uh, explain a little further because in yeah. our setup we really do not give any food or uh, reward in terms of food in the Correct. system. Uh, yeah. Why is this? Because our ants are scavengers; they hunt termites, and they will okay. bring dead termites back to their nest. And they are solitary foragers; they never ever recruit their colony members or make a chemical trail in order to go and get food. So. all our experiments deal only with moving from one nest to another and only in this context they show tandem running right so the reward i mean inverted comma reward is that the colony which is entirely exposed in the old nest and is vulnerable right because you don't want your house roof to have collapsed because that is what we do in the old nest we take the roof off literally so uh the entire colony the queen and the brood of the colony is exposed and they have in a great hurry to find an alternate nest and move into this for the safety of their entire colony right so the reward is being able to go there quickly is itself the reward right there is no food element that comes inside and in fact if i bring food that complicates the process Right, so yes. we want to have only one single motivation, which is to move your nest. Am I clear, Jaydeep? Have I answered what you asked? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Jaydeep. Uh, since we are running a little bit short on time, uh, I would ask Sumana to uh, just have a quick look at the Q and A box uh, that's there and see if there are any questions which you think would be important to answer at the moment. Uh, and uh, let me see how to look at the q and a box yeah you can just click on the q and a box tab here did i see yeah there i see there are 19 question yeah there are 19 so maybe we can answer uh, two or three at the moment because we are running a little bit uh, short on time uh, in the meantime i'll ask uh, kamal preet to uh, ask her question live since he has raised her hand okay uh, kamal preet you can uh, speak Okay, I uh, okay. Uh, before uh, come on, Kamal Preet, I'll just uh, I see another thing about the ethical issue again here, and the point is I agree with you that we are traumatizing the ants by flooding their nests, by blinding them, by doing different things. In case of uh, blinding, we know that the ants can groom the paint off from their eyes, and within a day or two, they become normal. In terms of flooding, uh, we flood them. in order to make them relocate and once our colony uh, our job in the lab is done we send the colony back or release them back in the habitat from which we took them however we do cause major disturbance to their life uh, at the present there is no ethical guideline for which to do these things maybe in a civilized society as human civilization gets better we should come up with guidelines as to how to do these uh, experiments uh Yes, thank you so much, Sumana. And we've also uh, we are gonna cop copy paste the questions and send them to you. So later on, you may be able to answer them at. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. But there are two questions which I'd like to finish with. Uh, sure. And uh, 
first one is that uh, because uh, we also have this conversation we have a couple of very passionate researchers on insects here we've yes. got shannon and axel and axel yes, works sure. on bees so axel yes. goes a lot about uh, talks a lot about you know humanely treating bees and you know yes. uh, making sure that uh, they are controlled in a humane manner um, yes. uh, while you know when they are usually smoked out etc so is there a way that we can actually deal with uh, you know uh, ants uh, living in a garden is fine but sometimes if they uh, invade our house too much it, it could be problem yes. problematic uh, yes. is there a way to actually just deal with this in a more humane uh, humane way yeah no see there are uh, i mean it it goes beyond there is uh, tens of thousands of uh, dollars of uh, uh, damage that ants cause in electric and electronic circuitry around the world Uh, because they will go inside, uh, let's say, your computer and uh, make it malfunction, right? And similar such things outdoor as well. So one way is to prevent them from getting into these things. Uh, there is no, as of to the best of my knowledge, at least, uh, we do not have a way of uh, keeping them away other than the traditional method that India has followed for ages, which is to fill a little bowl of water. and keep all your sweets inside this bowl of water right that would be the most humane way of doing it in the uh, house or household uh, area uh, but in general without killing them without spraying them with uh, very poisonous chemicals uh, i do not know of a way of keeping out these ants where they are not required and uh, we routinely kill millions of these ants whether in the garden or the household or in uh, other facilities and we do not think twice about this so that is a cultural aspect that we have we do not really care for them uh, that possibly should change as we come up with techniques to prevent them from entering of course and i think the the only uh, good way to find out more ways to humanely control ants is to actually conduct more research uh, which yes. uh, of course students are doing yes. so th yes. uh, that's maybe you know in the future you'll you'll have an answer to this and the last question is this is a shout out to shannon uh, from our uh, from ncvs here she does a lot of work on chemical ecology so uh -huh. this may be someone who's uh, in her uh, uh, who's probably worked with her i think uh, Uh, are you interested in working on the olfactory receptors which are usually present in ants antennae in the future you know so uh, that way yeah yes uh, you're asking me or shannon <laughs> well, no uh, we're asking you but yeah okay. if, no, I'm, if I'm, you guys course, collaborate totally uh, this interested. is a conversation yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i know shannon as well and uh, i would be very very interested in looking at what are these olfactory sensors in the antenna and in other parts of the body and particularly to do with colony mate recognition and nest recognition uh because if you can make a place uh, smell something like that nest should not smell right you know put the smell of a parasite or something inside maybe that could be a way forward in order to get ants away from a given area or a focal area as such uh yes we need to do a great deal of research i would be happy to <laughs> work with uh, shannon on the olfactory senses okay yeah if uh, you know if there is a re if a collaboration happens this is the place where it began so anyways yes. so thank yes. you so much yes. uh, uh Most Sumana. and uh, we've uh, compiled a google doc uh, of all okay. the questions that have been unanswered we will share them with you and later on uh, we'll probably maybe put an article on our uh, social mm -hmm. media channels if anyone is interested so please uh, watch uh, watch our pages Uh, or uh, the blisk facebook and twitter and we will be sharing it there in a few days very soon uh, thank you very much sumana for this talk and i'd like to hand it over for hove over to saudamini for uh, the closing remarks of the session yeah sure yeah thanks uh, sumana for a very interesting talk uh, educating the young minds on uh, the science and biology of ants and also you had uh, introduced um, how a researcher thinks Starts with start with a question, uh, yes. design an experiment, hypothesize, and look at the results to critically analyze them. Uh, so it's very very interesting, and uh, you have a number of questions which uh, please uh, follow it up, and we'll put it up on the web page. Yeah, and sure. I'd like to thank you once again, and I also would like to thank the communications team for helping with this uh, series. And uh, to the audience, uh, we will meet uh, next week, uh, next Sunday, same time. Until then. 
प्लीज टेक केयर बाय bye 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 and please remember to share this talk on youtube uh, where uh, this will be remaining uh, after uh, after this session is over for anyone who's interested goodbye and have a good day okay yeah bye bye, bye.